Have you ever wondered where the television signal you are watching is coming from? Welcome to True North. Good evening and welcome to Maine Watch. Welcome to From the Vault, a celebration of 60 years of Maine public television. On this episode, we take a look at Maine's maritime heritage in the 1977 special, Home to the Sea. Now, rather than a standard documentary, this is more of an impressionistic film. We travel from the early years of European discovery, through wars, global trade, shipbuilding, and more. Gordon Bach composed and performs many of the songs, and it contains some incredible early film of wind jammers and steamers as far back as 1928. The production team also filmed many ships that came to Maine for the 1976 Bicentennial Tall Ship Celebration, as well as some locales and wrecked ships that are now gone. So let's go back to 1977 with Home to the Sea. up to see the morning light fall fresh on the sea. I stand there for time in the dawn, see how the tides and the winds are playing out their comings and goings. Some days the sea is sharp, cold, mean looking, and the wind feels like it come off an iceberg. Some days she's calm, brooding, too calm I'll say, a weather breeder. Then there's days when she's all aglow, a warm light of the day. Whatever the weather, the morning light fresh on the water seems to beckon. I always go out, if it's not too stormy. So the tide comes, and the people come too, for they see a fair land and green. And they try their ways in the bright windy bays and come home see again of itself from God and nature affordeth as much diversity of good commodities as any reasonable man can wish. Here are more good harbors for ships of all burthens than England can afford, and far more secure from all winds and weathers than any in England, Scotland, France, or Spain. The Europeans knew about the coast of Maine by 1614. They called it Hundred Harbored Maine while others sailed off to Mexico and South America in search of gold, John Smith discovered a different kind of treasure off Manhegan. In March, April, May, and half June, here is cod in abundance. In May, June, July, and August, mullet and sturgeon, whose rows do make caviar and patago. Herring, too, if any desire them. In the end of August, September, October, and November, you have cod again to make cornfish or poor John. Hake you may have when the cod fails in summer. And George Weymouth discovered yet another kind of treasure. The wood she beareth is not shrubbish, fit only for fuel, but goodly tall pine, spruce, birch, oak. Upon the hills grow notable trees, masts for ships of 400 ton. The further we went, the more pleasing it was to every man, alluring us still with expectation of better. 
Back then, the same as today, it was the abundance of natural gifts that made Maine important. Water, trees, granite, lumber, ice, fish, she had all of them, and the Europeans were learning to exploit them. It was because of these exploits that Maine was destined to become the mother of the wooden ship. During the great age of sail, you could find Maine-built ships all over the world, and Maine captains would comb the ocean highways looking for profitable cargoes. This is the King's Broad Arrow, and reserves for the crown this an all-white pine with a diameter of 24 inches at a foot above the ground. A penalty of 100 pounds will be imposed upon you for felling trees without a royal license. So in the late 1600s, the crown appointed a royal surveyor of pine and timber who cruised the Maine woods in search of those majestic white pines. They made excellent masts and bowsprits for the Royal Navy. England was queen of the sea in those days, but she'd been at war, and her ships needed masts and yards desperately. There is very good news comes from four of our New England ships, come home safe to Falmouth with masts for the king, which is a blessing mighty unexpected, and without which we might have failed next year. into a swamp to see a mast drawn about 26 inches or 28. About two and 30 oxen before and about four yoke by the side of the mast between the fore and hinder wheels. It is a notable sight. When daylight is a breaking from a slumber we awaken. When breakfast we have taken our axes we will grind. Let the frost be air so keen it will not keep us within. We'll make the valleys ring with the falling of the pine. Your Honor, so greedy are these men that I can no longer enforce the King's Broad Arrow policy. To the eastward at York, Wells, Kennebec, Sarko, Scarborough, and Casco Bay, they cut and saw at pleasure, send the trees where they will. For every mast sent to England, 500 trees have been cut or destroyed. Our shanty is our station, and the woods our occupation. Every man unto his station, with some to score in line, will take eight foot off a block. And a chip at every knock, and the wolves and deer do shock at the falling of the pine. Cam Falls here in Casco Bay, a commodious and fine harbor from which to carry on the business of Maston. I can see this Maston business will encourage the settlement of Falmouth as we need choppers, teamsters, mast rights, and stevedores to handle the great trees. On my own side, I'll be paid 110 pounds, coin of the realm, for the large mast, 48 pounds for the bowsprits, and 25 pounds for the yards. Load them up, boys. As the winter grows older, like wolves we do grow bolder, our axes we will shoulder, all pledges to resign. To the woods we will advance, with our axes clear to glance, like brothers we'll commence to fall a stately pine. Jingle and flowerwood makers are the greatest destroyers of the great white pine. They chop into the trees to see if they split well. Trees thus wounded soon perished to the great detriment of His Majesty's Navy. Some of these frontiersmen were so busy knocking down pine that they forgot to plant their crops. And it wasn't all that uncommon for whole families to perish for want of food. The cutting, hauling, and loading of those trees was no simple chore. Many of them were three feet in diameter at the base and 120 feet tall. 
Once the trees were down, they had to be guided through the woods, around the rocks, and down the rivers to the ports. When the winter has diminished and our shanty work is finished from the woods, we are banished for a little time. But at the approach of summer, we will collect the timber. We will collect our timber into handsome wraps of pine. In 1772, Maine shipped 382 masts, 69 bowsprits, and 451 spars to England. The masting trade provided work for a great many people. In 16 years, the town of Falmouth grew from 250 to 3,000 souls. And the arrival of a mast ship was a major event for a community. It meant news, passengers, and much needed finished goods from England. Maine was experiencing the first of many economic booms. Along with the bounty of the forests, another industry was developing, the New England silver mines, the fisheries. The first pioneers in Maine were not planters as they were in Plymouth, they were fishers. The coast abounded with such multitudes of cod that the inhabitants do dung their ground with cod. John Smith, one of the first, cleared 1,500 pounds coin of the realm for one voyage of profit from Monhegan. From Kittery Point and the Isle of Shoals, from Sagadahawk and Pemaquid, from Monhegan and Matinicus, fishing stations began to grow. They called them truck houses. The outer islands, like Monhegan, were close to fishing grounds that are famous now. Matinicus, the south southwest ground, Jeffrey's Ledge, and the still wagon banks were all within a day's sail. The islands offered some protection from the Indians, so that was where the flake yards were built, where they split and salted cod and made crawfish from cod pickled in brine. They also extracted oil from fish there and huge presses. As the fisheries grew, the markets and the profits grew with them. Right handy to the deep bays and coves was all the timber a man might need to build any kind of a vessel. There was oak, spruce, pine, and hackmatack right there for the cutting and caused to be built several ships, boats and vessels which they fitted out and victualled and loaded them with the produce of the said premises for Boston and other parts. The first vessel built here by the white man was the Virginia, launched in September 1607. She was built to carry the unsuccessful colonists from Popham back to Plymouth. Twenty years later, this little vessel still plied the waters between England and Virginia. It was no less common then to see a boat in front of a house than to see a pickup truck there today. They had no roads worth mentioning and the goods had to get to market. There were masts and staves and shingles, butter and vegetables, hogsheads of oil, quintals of fish, lath and boards. All of them had to go to market, so they built sloops and brigs and schooners and off they sailed. big mast ship sailed for England. 20 days from Falmouth, wind south, southwest, no gales, so we still carry a deck load of yards. And the schooner set out for Boston and the bay to bring those starving Plymouth farmers something to eat. Perhaps I'll return with flour. And I'll go to Portugal with cod. And I'll to England with darkfish. God, you let it bake under salt hay all summer, and the cat won't eat it. But in Bonnie, England, it's a delicacy. I'll to England. And the staves and clapboards and lumber. To the West Indies, man, in homewood barrels of molasses. You'll bring no rum home this time with you. You're bound to turn the Sally into a bumbo. A walking tavern, that's what she'll be. I'll have none of it. I said I'd bring molasses. Didn't say nothing about rum. Go to the West Indies and to your rum. Go! It couldn't last. The boom that began in the 1600s was strong, and like a spring tide, it brought the people to Maine. And then there was the revolution with a famous battle between the Unity and the Margareta and the Chayas. And the burning of Falmouth and the Penobscot expedition in Castine. The British wanted their masts, so they fought for Castine on the Penobscot and burned their biggest masting port, the town of Falmouth. 
There are historians who say that if we'd cut off the supply of masts earlier, there would have been no revolution. There would have been no British Navy. People had left, our fisheries had come to a standstill, and so had the merchant fleet. Many of our inhabitants are destitute of bread without means to procure it. Our coasting and fishing vessels are all taken or destroyed. Large quantities of spires and masts procured at great expense have for several years been decaying on our shores for lack of opportunity to export them. But the tide would turn. It always does. The new nation was free, free of British shipping regulations and free to travel the seven seas in search of profit. And ships were needed. I do advise and order you to sail and make the best of your way to Cape Town, South Africa. The shores of the Piscataqua, the Kennebec and the Sheepscot rivers came alive with shipbuilding activity. And thence to Ile de France where you shall sell your cargo of candles, prunes and other fruit. Between 1794 and 1812, Shipbuilding was to grow 300%. Over 200 new towns were incorporated along the coast and on the great timber-lined rivers. Main vessels sailed away to the east, to China, India, and Sumatra for pepper, silk, tea, and chinaware. You will sail to the Mediterranean by the most advantageous route and there sell your whole of 480 quintals of cod, 225 barrels of pickled salmon. To Russia with sea otters captured on the northwest coast and back to Portland where the Russian hemp was made into rope. You are required to embrace the most favorable winds and proceed to Liverpool direct. There you will load with dry goods. To Chile and Peru, they sailed in search of seals. 17,000 white oak staves, 5,700 barrel staves, and several hogsheads of sugar. To Canton and Sydney, Bombay and Java to bring home the bounty. You will then load with wine and specie for trade in Bombay and Calcutta and return to Boston with the finished goods. Sugar, cotton, textiles, coffee, tea, and specie. As main men worked to fashion the river timber in a stately cargo carriers, the owners listened carefully to the tales of their captains. Captain Sturgis reporting, sir. At Macau Roads, I was forced to anchor in the calms. Sixteen pirate junks were waiting for just this opportunity. Being a cargo vessel, we had only a few guns. My men were able to hold the pirates off till the breeze made up and we could find the shelter of the Portuguese fort. Captain Silsby, reporting on the voyage to Portland, captured by a French privateer and taken to Malaya. I got her free, but we were recaptured and taken to Genoa, where we were forced to become the officer's ship for Bonaparte and forced to sail for Egypt. While the French took our ships for cargo, the British press gangs took our men. England was desperate for men to man her vast navy. Many Maine boys served as sailors in the British fleet during the French War. 
The great and increasing dangers with which our vessels, our seamen, and merchandise are threatened on the high seas and elsewhere by the belligerent powers of Europe, it is of great importance to keep in safety these essential resources. With those words, President Jefferson informed Congress he was closing all U.S. ports to foreign shipping. It was our nation's first embargo. Our ships all in motion once whitened the ocean. They sailed and returned with their cargo. Now doomed to decay, they have all fallen prey to Jefferson worms and embargo. A French privateer can have nothing to fear. She always may here or may there go. Their friendship is such, and we love them so much, we'll let them slip through the embargo. The British should take a few men by mistake who under false colors may then go. We're manning their fleet with our tars who retreat from poverty, sloth, and embargo. In spite of the embargo, Maine skippers knew there was a market for their goods in war-torn Europe, and some managed to circumvent the embargo. I wasn't trying to circumvent nothing. I was fishing on the banks of Newfoundland, and I lost my compass overboard. Terrible storm came up, I was blown off course. Next thing I knew, I was in Portugal. Well, no point in carrying fish around while they rot, so I sold my catch and sailed home. Took aboard a few lemons for my men to prevent scurvy, don't you know? The embargo, like a quiet dream tide, left the vessels ashore. Anyone who had anything to do with a ship, carpenters, blacksmiths, sailmakers, lumbermen, merchants, teamsters, farmers, you could find them in the public squares at the soup lines in 1808. And the ships, as if washed ashore, lay at anchor, their sails unbent, their spars down, and tar barrels capping the lower mastheads. They called these ships Jefferson's nightcaps. So the tides go, and the people go too, with little to show for their pains. And ever they go, and they take what they know, and go back to the kinder lands. When the War of 1812 started, we weren't much of a match for the British. Our whole naval force was only six frigates and as many smaller vessels against a thousand ships of the British Royal Fleet. So our people turned to privateering. Private vessels were fitted out with guns and a letter of marque from the federal government giving the owners permission to stock prizes on the trade routes. The prizes were sold with shares for the owner and shares for the government. The American cruisers daily enter in among our convoys, seize prizes in sight of those that should afford protection, and if pursued, put on their sea wings and laugh at the English pursuers. Angered by our insolence, the British sent the Bulwark, a 74, to blockade main ports. famous Maine privateer. She never suffered defeat, never attacked a ship in vain, was never injured by a hostile shot, and let me tell you, she knew no equal in speed. She was manned by a crew of gallant lads, as ever a vessel's deck had trod, a score and a hundred of them all. Their fate is known to none but God. They all belonged to the towns around. There were brothers and cousins. 
friends and comrades too Full armed and equipped they put to sea And the skies were never a softer blue But the weeks and the months and the years sped on And hearts grew hopeless and cheeks grew pale And eyes are dim that have watched so long To catch a glimpse of her homebound sail When any of those who love the lads Are ready to slip their moorings here And sail away to the unknown port You'll see the dead ship gliding near There a legend was born The dash became the ghost ship of Casco Bay She'd appear sailing up the bay at night whenever a relative of one of her crew was dying. The war ended in February, 1815. In spite of the adventures of vessels like Dash, the British blockade and the raids on our ports took their toll. The merchants of Portland and other smaller ports either went under or else they moved to Boston and New York. short and the year gets old and the fish won't stay where the water's gold so if you're going to fill your hole you go offshore and find them and you go outside on the raven deep and you pray the lord your soul to keep but the wave will roll us all to sleep and the tide will be our keeper I gave you one, I gave you two, the best that poor old boat could do. You won't be happy till I give you three, but I'll be damned if you'll get me. Ah, oh, the tide, ah, oh, the tide, ah, oh, the dark and the bitter tide. There's none would have me by her side, for the tide would be my master. When a deep water skipper from Maine set about building his house, he made certain of two things. He built his house facing the sea, for the sea was his gateway to the world. And he built a big house because he wanted everyone to know of his success. He furnished his house with the wares of other lands where he had traded. This man had every reason to be proud. He knew that over 10% of the nation's captains had come from his native state, and that over one third of the nation's merchant ships were built along Maine rivers. He had seen the world for himself. To him, events in Canton were as important as events in Belfast or Portland. To his children, Singapore was as close as Boston, for they had spent time in each place. Arithmetic in school included a section on navigation, and currency exchange and other languages were commonplace. From the time Maine became a state until the outbreak of the Civil War, the tide was fair for the Maine native as long as he followed the sea. The ways of man are passing strange. He buys his freedom and he counts his change. Then he lets the wind his days arrange and he calls the tide his master. I was born in December the year of 1800, just about the right time the way I figure it, because I was part of it all. The great age of sail, the golden years. If you was a boy after the War of 1812, you got your sea legs in the coasting trade. Most young boys did. When I was in my 20s, I shipped out in the old West Indies trade aboard the good ship Polly. We saw some things aboard her, and pirates wasn't the least of them. I could tell you tales that'd take the hair right off in your head and set you to using your knees as nutcrackers. 
The winter of 31, when I was home, they had found a market cutting ice. So I built an ice house up along the river. Got into the ice business, good business, too. Lasted till Frigidaire put us out. When we weren't cutting ice, we was cutting hay. And if that didn't suit you, you could go to building ships. From sunup to sundown, men find their living in the main shipyards. For a dollar a day, they work for 14 long daylight hours during the main summer. It is all hard labor. The tanned, scarred hands of the skilled shipwrights testify that muscle is the equal of mind in this business. On launching day, everyone in the village gathers at the shipyard to see the vessel take the water. Slowly, she moves for the first time. She will always be alive with motion as her bottom comes and goes on the endless tide. She will never sleep as long as her home is on the sea. The ship is like a living thing. As she catches the morning breeze, the ship comes alive and begins to breathe and groan and move. Those that weren't building them were sailing them all over the world. Or else it was in the lumber business or the lime business or the kilnwood business. Oh, it was something I'll tell you, plenty to do. During the middle, 1800s was what they called the shipbuilding era, when they built many, many ships. And of course, wherever there was work, people will go. So it doubled the population of the, of the town during those years. First it was the clippers, built sleek and narrow. They could go, they could fly, I'll tell you, but they couldn't carry much because they were so fine and fast. The skippers I know had some great races in them, though. After the clippers came the big down easters. Now they could carry tons and tons of wheat or cotton or guano. I'll let someone else tell you what guano is. I never went for guano. We are bound for the Chincher Islands for guano, the manure of birds which is much in demand in European and American ports as a strong fertilizer. The guano is rotten and as fine as powder and full of ammonia. We carry a deck load of Chinese coolies to load the vile manure. On this voyage, we round the horn. I hope this rotten old ship will survive the pounding. I don't think much of life on the ocean wave, even though I've had my blood stirred more in the last five months than I would have in 10 years ashore in Portland. I'm ready to cut the webs from my feet and walk on solid dirt once again. Many times the seamen wouldn't sail because they had a superstition that if rats left a ship, she would be wrecked before she came back to port again. Last night, Morgan, Charlie, Fred, and John Smith ran away. The night before Andrew and Wilson took a French leave, they saw the rats jumping ship. This shall be my last voyage as captain, for I am tired of hard bread, salt beef, dirty stewards, and vulgar sailors as fellow prisoners. And that is all shipboard life is, a floating prison of the worst kind. Five days out from Philadelphia, we are loaded with coal and bound for Sitka, Alaska and then San Francisco, where we'll load wheat for Sydney, Australia. After five days, the routine of shipboard life has been established. The first few days out are always hard because the sails are more or less drunk. Everyone gets seasick and grumbly. But I like being back on ship with my pets, particularly my sheep, Billy. I also have a canary named Diggy and a dog and a cat. When there is so little human companionship, one becomes very fond of animals. At exactly 9 o'clock, Mum begins a lesson. It goes until noon. Eight bells. It's 12 noon. That's my dad calling out the time from looking at the sun with a sextant. When my dad was sick one time, Mum took the sun with a sextant three days and worked out the position of the ship. In the afternoon, the children work at their lessons. I pass the time sewing or walking on deck. Perhaps I will spend some time practicing at the piano. 
No two days are alike at sea, and while life is monotonous, it is a pleasant kind of monotony. In a way, there is variety. Some days we engage the cook and make candy, but I do miss being with other women. On special days, I get to go up forward to the carpenter shop and watch Chips work. Chips is a fine carpenter, and were it not for his habit with a bottle, he could find steady employment as a carpenter on shore. I think the officers and men enjoy having children on board. Often they send gifts back for the children to play with. But we were never allowed to go forward of the main hatch by ourselves or to have any conversation with any sailor. And worst of all, we were never allowed to go aloft. July 4th, two of the crew down with cholera. A year ago, I was home in Maine for the picnic and parade. The cook killed the pig, and that's the last a shellback like me will see of pork unless I kill the old man. Oh, how I hate to smell that pork cooking, when all I get is duff and bread scones and molasses, and when we get salt beef, it still has dirt and gravel on it from the foul barrels it was stored in. Oh, God, two coolies fell overboard and were lost. And now, 250 pagans chatter about the deck with a language that sounds like the devil's work. At least I can board other ships and see friends. Spent July 4th with Pendleton and family of Searsport. We decided July 4th that Yankeedom is the greatest dumb except the kingdom of heaven. The hold is full of guano. Dust and ammonia clog our nostrils. It'll be good to be outside where the air is fresh and clean. This ship is loaded to the gills with Bono. She's sluggish in the water. God save us from heavy weather round in the horn. The glass is falling and the wind freshening. The gale will blow and I fear for the ship. We man the pumps in 20-minute shifts. We've lost one mast, and I fear now for my life. I'll not see terra firma again, I fear. This ship sinks in spite of our efforts. But the wave will roll us all to sleep and the tide will be our keeper. Ships did go down, but when the backbone of a new one is laid on the blocks, a new life begins, usually on the banks of a river convenient for launching. The stern post is then raised and framing out can begin. Over 40 carpenters are employed framing out the vessel. The great timbers are shaped by razor-sharp adzes, wielded with skill and muscle that renders the rough-hewn timber smooth as glass. The pieces of the frames are then assembled on the portable framing platform, and the frame gang twitches the assembled frame into place along the keel. When all the frames are in place and they've been bolted to the keel along with the keelson, the stem is fitted. The finest white oak in the yard is used here, for that stem will cut water for thousands and thousands of miles. Most of my deep water salmon was to the West Indies. They had to have barrels for their molasses and sugar, and guava jelly, and rum, because that was a very important item, rum. That was part of the sailor's pay. Well, the whole West Indies trade is circular, you see. Men cut trees in Maine so they can build ships. They build ships so they can go to the West Indies for molasses. They need the molasses to feed the men who cut the trees. Molasses is supposed to sweeten the unsweetened wilderness, you see. October 15th, loaded with lumber, staves, hoops, and shingles bound from Bangor to St. Vincent, where we'll load for molasses and return to Maine. Between Bangor and Brewer, there would be so many schooners tied up that they could walk from one shore to the other 
across the desk. They probably had to jump a little, but you could get across the river on just the decks of the schooners that were tied up. We made two trips a year to the West Indies, one in October after the hurricanes, and we'd be back in Maine in February. We turned right around, go right back down again. Then we'd be home in April. Then it was time to go farming. Young James, a capable lad from down east, has come down with a dreaded yellow fever, contracted, I suppose, in Havana. I fear he'll not live to see his kin. Yellow fever would get you and kill you real quick. And if the fever didn't get you, it might be hurricane. And if it wasn't a hurricane, it could be pirates. They got old Captain Clems, I've heard tell. First they cut off his right arm, then his left, then one leg, then the other. Finally, they filled his mouth with oakum, saturated it with oil, and set it afire. That finally killed him. Tough old dog he was. Come, come, come. I fear we're stuck in the hoss latitudes. Our water is very low, there's no rain, and I fear we'll have to throw the livestock overboard. If hurricanes and water spouts make a man jump with fear, calms will wear him to a frazzle. In the calms with a constant sliding a boat and no progress, nerves get shot and men begin to fight. I've spent over a week in the calms. They call them hustle attitudes because when the ship runs out of water, they throw the livestock overboard. I've heard of ships stuck for weeks. I've heard men died of thirst or perhaps in a fight with another sailor. A breeze is making up from the south. It could mean rain, but I think not, for we saw porpoise playing about the bow. Always a good sign. Yesterday, it rained so hard it came down in sheets. Barrels were placed everywhere on deck to catch the precious water. I ordered the scuppers plugged so the deck could be washed with fresh water. All the sailors came out and washed their clothes on the decks. Our spirits are high as we have had fair winds for the past 12 days. Tomorrow, we begin to buck the westerlies around the horn. Rounding the horn is cold, dark, and cheerless. Today, we give the men coffee instead of lime juice, as it is so cold. Tomorrow, if the temperature drops one more degree, they'll get rum instead of coffee. The cook killed the pig as we went around the horn. He always kills the pig rounding the horn. Four months out now, and the monotony of shipboard life becomes tiresome. Our little cabin, with its polished, paneled hardwood, grows smaller and warmer as we are at the equator in the Pacific. Our ship is our home, but one does grow restless after four and a half months at sea. For a ship to be a home, she had to be sound, and the men in Maine built strong vessels. Plankers, among the highest paid men in the yard, put the skin on the vessel that would separate the crew from eternity. With brute strength and a quick eye, they twist the steaming hot plank into shape on the frames. Then come the fasteners, who, with the aid of clamps and spikes and hand-hewn trunnels, fasten the freshly shaped plank to the frames. The outboard joiners follow the plankers to smooth the surface of the new hull with slicks and planes. Then come the caulkers with their mallets and irons. They drive oakum into the beveled seams between the planks. At the same time, more carpenters lay the decks and build the forecastle, deck houses, and hatch combs. The tall spars are shaped by adsmen and hauled into place by teams of horses or oxen in consort with giant derricks. The excited yells and songs of the rigging gang can be heard all over town on a hazy summer afternoon as they step first the lower masts and then the topmasts.
Today, an albatross came on deck. They are huge birds, and they hardly move their wings when they fly. On deck, they act like they are drunk, and they get seasick. No two days are alike at sea. We've had headwinds for eight days. Two weeks of headwinds. At night, I now dream of farming. In San Francisco, we discharged our coal and loaded wheat for Sydney. 53 days to Sydney. Beautiful weather. I turned 13 in Sydney and was given a beautiful ring of the different kinds of Australian gold. Sad thing happened. Billy attacked the first mate and was voted a nuisance and left in Sydney. Well, when we got home in February of 31, I decided I'd had my fill of shipboard life. In Maine, they found they could cut ice out of the river for nothing and ship it south and get good money for it. So I got into the ice business. We had a horse-drawn cutter, which we plowed the ice and worked out the strips some 50 foot in length. Then these strips were scored crosswise so the field looked like a gigantic checkerboard. Saurus cut the long lines and men with pick poles moved the strips to the conveyor belt up to the ice house. As the strip moved up the belt, the chopper cut off big blocks, which we stored, embedded in sawdust. Many, many men were employed cutting and harvesting ice and shipping it to the south on schooners, to Baltimore and as far south as New Orleans and the West Indies. They would cut and store the ice in the winter, and when the price got high, they would sail with it in May. So you see, when we wasn't making ice, we was making hay. While a team of riggers are at work, carvers fashion the intricate trail boards and figureheads. Good carving work on a vessel was recognized throughout the world as a sign of the owner's pride in his fleet. The inboard joiners fashion the elegant captain's quarters aft, as well as the more modest crew's quarters forward. And the painters are at work putting copper on the bottom and painting the top sides. In the sail loft, more men work cutting the four or 5,000 square yards of canvas that will power the vessel. With great care, riggers bend on the sails. Sails and rigging have to be strong for the ship to ply the highways of the world. Our next stop is San Francisco. Almost a year has passed. I'm growing anxious to settle again in our lovely Maine. In San Francisco, I had the most fun riding around the deck on a velocipede. From San Francisco to Dublin, if we have a good passage, the men shall paint the ship inside and out. I love the city of Dublin with its wonderful zoo. But my oldest daughter is graduating from Brunswick High School and I'd like to be with her when she receives her diploma. You will board a channel steamer to Holly Head, and then the ocean steamer from Liverpool to Boston. The channel steamer in Europe was mimicked in Maine by the packets and the night boats. These steam-powered vessels made scheduled sailings from Boston to Portland, Rockland, Bangor, Bar Harbor, and Eastport. The steamer routes took hold about the time the big downeasters began to disappear. Commerce raiders during the Civil War destroyed many of the big wooden ships, and Great Britain took advantage of the situation by taking over many of the routes sailed by American vessels before the Civil War. It was sad to leave the ship solitaire, my home on the ocean for two years. The next time I saw her, she'd been dismasted and was serving as a coal barge in our own state of Maine. It seemed a desecration, but such is the fate of those fine old living ships. At least she came home to die.
But the tides go and the people go too With little to show for their pains But ever they go and they take what they know And go back to the kinder land The tide was contrary for the grand, full-rigged wooden ships on the Maine coast. But Maine would adapt. She would look into her past and see that the schooner had always been the errand boy along the coast. Shipbuilders took the basic design and adapted it to new needs. While perishable cargoes went by steam because they could go on time, bulk cargoes gave new life to the schooner. Bangor, located on the Penobscot River, was at one time the lumber capital of the world. It was schooners that carried the lumber, all 200 million board feet per year, to ports along the coast, Boston, New York, Philadelphia. Boston alone received 574 schooners from Maine in 1835. They carried firewood south, cutting a cord in Maine for a dollar and selling it in Boston for two and New York for three. Later, they carried coal north to heat main homes. These vessels were cheap to run. The rig was simple, and they only needed small crews. And they installed deck engines to help with pumping and lifting. Schooners grew in size along with their cargoes. The two-masted schooners were followed by the turn, or three masters, and then four, five, and six masts. But the small schooners never really died. They continued to carry cords of wood to the lime kilns at Rockland, Rockport, and Thomaston. Over 30 cords of wood were needed to fire a kiln for a week. And then the lime had to be taken to market. Again, schooners were called to do the job. Granite on the main coast had the edge over its competition because it could be transported easily by water. And again, it was the schooner workhorse of the main coast that took the water fountains and the paving stones to New York and the columns to Philadelphia. It is one of the ironies of history that the schooners carried granite to build railroad stations in the industrial cities of the Northeast. Suddenly there was no need for schooners. Timber and granite left Maine by rail. With the coming of the railroad, Maine had turned her back on the sea she was born facing the sea, and she gave to the world magnificent vessels, capable crews, and valuable cargoes. So the tides go, and the people go too, with little to show for their pain. And ever they go and they take what they know and go home to the kinder land. The railroad changed Maine forever. No longer would the coast abound with schooners running errands daily to Boston. No longer would scores of men go to work on the coves and bays as skilled shipwrights who mastered the ads and auger. Today, on the banks of the Kennebec at Bath, great steel ships are being built for merchant and military use. During World War II, the Bath Iron Works launched a fully rigged destroyer every three weeks. But even that activity is not what it once was. The proud skipper of a hundred years ago is gone. His house is probably filled with tourists, and if he were to look out of his windows, he would find the harbor empty save for the fisherman who still faces the sea each morning as he watches the sun rise on the water. The fisherman still builds his house facing the sea. His days, like the days of the captains and the fishermen before him, are bound up in the chill winds and the endless tides. His young family, like those families before them, have learned quickly how to pass the time. They wait for him each and every day. They know he will always go home to the sea for his living.
her passing strange he buys his freedom and he counts his change then he lets the wind his days arrange and he calls the tide his master ah the days ah the days ah the fine long summer days the fish come rolling in the bays and he swore he'd never leave me but the days grow short and the year gets old and the fish won't stay where the water's cold so if you're going to fill your hold you gotta go offshore and find them and you go outside on the raven deep and you pray the lord your soul will keep but the wave will roll us all to sleep and the tide will be our keeper Tide. If I can't have him by my side, well, I guess I have to leave him. All oh, the days, all oh, the days, all oh, the fine long summer days, the fish come rolling in the bays, and he swore he'd never leave me. I gave you two the best that rotten old boat could do. You won't be happy till I give you three, but I'll be damned if you'll get me. Oh, the tide, oh, the tide, oh, you dark and you bitter tide. I know the day will come when one less boat comes slogging home. I don't mind knowing that he'll be the one, but I can't spend my whole life waiting. I gave you one, I gave you two, the best that poor old boat could do. You'd have it all before you threw. Well, I got no more to give you. All the days, all the days, all the fine long summer days, the fish come rolling in the bays, and he swore he'd never leave me. The ways of man are passing strange. His change, then he lets the wind his days arrange, and he calls the tide his master. So the tide comes, and the people come too, for they see a fair land and green, and they try their ways in the bright windy bays, and come home to the sea.